great to be in Iowa. Good morning. I consider myself from eastern Iowa, a town called Boston. <laughs> My very first snowstorm in uh, Washington, D.C. after having moved down from Boston, because where I lived in eastern Iowa, we, like you folks out here, uh, knew how to deal with cold and snow. And here I am in my office, 1977, and I look out my window, and there going down the streets of Washington, D.C. was <clears throat> a, a sand truck, followed by a saw truck, followed by a snow plow. <laughs> and I realized at that moment that I had moved to a third world country, and I feared for our future. Uh, so being out here and seeing how you folks deal with it, uh, you need to teach Washington about more than just ethanol. But you're doing a great job teaching Washington about ethanol. And I'm here primarily to say thank you. Now, it's going to take me a half an hour to say thank you. But that's what I'm here to do. Because you folks have done so much. Can I just say from the outset, we need to figure out a way to clone Governor Terry Branstad, the guy's phenomenal. You know it, you know him, he's, he's been uh, such a strong proponent of agriculture, value-added agriculture and ethanol for so long. But in Washington, D.C., it's rare that you see somebody with so much passion. He talked about the hearing in Washington, D.C. that uh, EPA had on the RFS in early December, and he went there and bunch of mid-level bureaucrats at the agency convening this hearing and listening to the more than 12 hours of testimony were somewhat surprised to see a governor sitting in front of them, and I can assure you were stunned by the amount of passion that he brought with him to that event. And he's absolutely right. He talked about the college kids wearing their blue t-shirts saying stop the RFS and ethanol increases food prices and all these other kind of slogans that the oil companies have paid them to wear. And they had no idea what they were advocating for. They were there because they wanted beer money. And as they listened to the governor, I watched it, they started to applaud. And Bob Greco, the guy from API that had hired them to be there, was shooting them dirty looks. What, you, what are you doing? And I'm just laughing. This is the Midwest people. They get it. They understand. But beyond the governor, who's phenomenal, the rest of your congressional delegation, Chuck Grassley, for example, Tom Harkin, you just heard from, they get it too. Chuck Grassley was instrumental in working with Senator Durbin to get more than 30 of his colleagues from both sides of the aisle to write a letter to Gina McCarthy at EPA saying, what you're doing is foolish. You need to implement the RFS as Congress had intended it to be implemented. It's a great letter, great message, the politics of it, listening to, you know, with 30 senators, 31 senators actually on that letter. You can't get 31 senators to agree that Mother's Day is a good idea. But Chuck Grassley got them to understand that this is a priority and it was a tremendous effort. Congressman Braley, another one in your de congressional delegation, that yesterday, working with an organization called Vote Vets, submitted a petition to EPA with 110,000 signatures on it, veterans saying, don't change the RFS. This is ultimately about national security. We need to stop sending our best and brightest into harm's way, defending the free flow of oil. And the only way that we can do that is if we have more domestic renewable fuels, more ethanol, more biodiesel. This is 110,000 bets that sent that message to Gina McCarthy. Phenomenal. And we appreciate it. But it goes beyond even your congressional delegation. Bill Couser, who I think is probably still in the room, is, is now Gina McCarthy's best friend in Iowa. He hosted her at the Iowa Fair last year. He was in D.C. last week, meeting again with EPA. He's met with Gina McCarthy so much, poor Bill's now speaking with a Boston accent and roots for the Red Sox. <laughs> That's the level of commitment that you people show. Now, earlier, Steve uh, was talking about the need for you to be advocates. 
I, I'm proud to know, you know, Rick Schwark here sits on my board, but he is one of the most passionate advocates I've ever seen. Rick also went to that hearing in D.C. And he talked about how important ethanol was, not just to Iowa farmers, but to the world's economies. And how ethanol was actually helping third world countries. We're not just throwing food at them. We're giving them the tools to grow that food themselves. We're giving them the markets so that they can compete on the global scale. And he talked with passion about what that means in third world countries. You could have heard a pin drop. You've got jaded bureaucrats from, from EPA listening to Rick and hanging on his every word. That's powerful stuff. Walt Wendland. I had an opportunity to read Walt's comments to EPA in uh, the RVO. And in two pages, he described the struggles of America's farmers and explain to EPA why we do not need to return to the 1980s, thank you very much. It was personal. It was compelling. It's what many of you in this room somewhat take for granted because you live it. And you got a bunch of bureaucrats at EPA that think of Iowa as that flyover state. Gina McCarthy had never been to a farm until uh, Bill Cowser brought him to one. She's regulating the ethanol industry. She's regulating farmers. She never even been to a farm. She's a great lady. I happen to like her. I speak her language and her accent. We're both Red Sox fans. But she didn't get it until she came here. And now she does. So what you're doing is critically important. And I would echo Steve's comments to you to be advocates, to get in the game. Whenever there's a negative article in the Chicago Trib or the you know, Des Moines Register, I know that Rick Schwark isn't just picking up the phone to complain to me about it. I know he's picking up his pen and he's writing and he's explaining why they're wrong. We all need to do that more. We are up against a highly motivated, very well-financed opposition. We're up against the richest companies in the history of the world. Oh, did I say the world? The richest companies in the history of the universe. Got to think big. Ron Fagan's in the room. And they are irritated. They're, they don't like the fact that a bunch of farmers from Iowa have taken 10% of their barrel, 10% of their market, and if they allow this program to continue to its ultimate goal, they will lose a third of the barrel. They can't stand the thought that they would be losing market share to the people in this room. Well, sorry, but we're going to win this challenge. <laughs> the reason I know we're gonna win is because they're desperate right now. They're so desperate they are funding robocalls across the country. They have more money than anybody in the world, the universe. And they're using that money to scare people. The robocall goes something like this. There are extremists. You're extremist people. There are extremists in Washington, D.C. that are trying to increase the amount of ethanol in our gasoline. And that's going to, <coughs> excuse me, Drive up the price of food and ruin your engine. There's no truth to that. But if I were home watching American Idol and I'm interrupted and, and I hear about extremists that want to increase the price of food and it's going to ruin my engine, 
I'm going to hit one. I had to stop my wife from doing that. <laughs> but not really. She gets it. I'm going to hit one, and I'll generate a comment to EPA. So the API is manufacturing comments from people that don't know any better, that haven't talked to one of you, that believe their nonsense that somehow ethanol is going to drive up the price of food, that are scared that it might have an impact on an engine because they haven't heard from Ricardo and they don't know that it's actually a good thing for your engine. That's what we're up against. They're advertising, not just in Washington, D.C., but in key congressional districts across the country. And they trot out a mechanic who quotes a CRC study that they funded, eight vehicles, and says, well, higher ethanol blends are going to blow up your engine. We'll leave you stranded on the side of the road. Write to your congressman. Tell him to repeal the RFS. Now, we're trying to compete with that, <laughs> but that's a well-funded and highly motivated opposition. And they will say anything, and they will do anything to try to beat you. And unfortunately, they have found all too frequently a willing partner in the media. Media gets a lot of advertising dollars from their companies. And it seems all too frequently the East Coast media elites are very quick to adopt their talking points without investigating the facts. So they'll say, yeah, ethanol, of course, it increases food. It's grown from corn, right? I've been in meetings where Walt Wendland has challenged editorial boards to eat the corn that's processed into ethanol because it'll chip a tooth. It's, it's not the sweet corn we grow in southern Maryland. It's the corn you folks are growing. You know the difference. But the East Coast media elite, they don't know the difference. They think, oh yeah, it's food, right? You try to explain to them, oh no, 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 no. We just use the starch in the corn. And I'm the poster child for the fact that there's too much starch in our diet, right? What we leave behind is a really high-value, high-protein feed product. Believe me, as uh, I think the, the governor said earlier, you're talking to people that think their food comes from the Safeway. They're not going to understand byproducts and DDG and feed markets. So the East Coast and the, the media elites take that and run with it. Deforestation. Well, of course, if you're growing corn for ethanol, we have to be chopping down the, the rainforest, right? And you try to tell these people, no, that's not right. That forestation in this country has gone up, not down. And deforestation in Brazil has, is down dramatically since the RFS has been in place. But they don't want the facts to get in, in the way of their storyline. And so they continue it. Last year at the Super Bowl, there were stories going around about how chicken wings were in short supply. And if you were going to watch the Super Bowl this year, you were going to be paying more for your chicken wings. There wasn't a scintilla of truth to it. And in fact, after the Super Bowl was over, the statistics show that, as we always do, we broke another record for chicken wings last year. And Purdue went away happily, making lots of money on their chicken wings. But the media ran with that story because they're hearing it from the oil companies. I have heard the media talk about ethanol driving up the price of gasoline. Fox News does this to me all the time. It, it drives me crazy. There's one reporter on Fox News that just can't get it out of her head that somehow ethanol is increasing the price of gasoline. And I say to her when I'm on the news, no, ethanol is less expensive than gasoline. Oh, well that might be technically true, but you don't get the mileage with it, and so it's actually more costly. No! Ethanol, even with a mileage penalty, is a bargain for consumers. 
but they, they keep on going. I heard one yesterday. It, it made me pull my hair out. CNN had a scroll at the bottom of the news saying corn ethanol, which is mandated by the federal government, is driving up the price of propane and natural gas because they're drying all this corn. <laughs> um, and, and you just want to, you, you want to yell at somebody. So I'm yelling at you. Because when we were drying corn this fall, price of natural gas was just fine. How about somebody in New York recognize that maybe Mother Nature has something to do with natural gasoline prices going up. Maybe it's not the corn ethanol mandate. Maybe it's got something to do with the single coldest January on record. Maybe that's got something to do with natural gasoline and propane. But no, that's, that's not in their storyline. They will say anything to undermine political and public support for this program. There was a time a while back when we were getting all this that I, I envisioned in my own mind. You know the game Seven Degrees of Kevin Bacon where people will try to think of movie stars and within seven relationships get back to Kevin Bacon? Well, in my own mind, I see these PR folks sitting around the table playing seven degrees of the RFS. If there's a problem in the world, ultimately they can drive it back to the RFS. That's what we're up against. I still maintain that we are going to win this fight. Our fight is not with EPA. They get it. Our fight is, right now, with the White House, with an administration that got confused about its priorities last summer, that thought that somehow the price of credits was going to drive up the price of gasoline. Now, I believe that the administration still supports its climate agenda. I think the president's probably going to talk about that tonight at the State of the Union. Well, the only program that we have that is reducing carbon emissions is the RFS. So if you still want to reduce carbon, why are you backing off on the RFS? I think the administration still cares about jobs. Well, if you care about jobs, why would you back off on this important program that is responsible for more than 400,000 jobs across this economy? You wouldn't. I think this administration is still sensitive to gas prices, no question. Well, here we got a gift recently. A study was completed, not funded by the ethanol industry, not funded by anybody related to corn or agriculture. This was a study from Phil Verliger, who has been an energy consultant for decades. He was in, I believe, the Carter administration when they had an energy policy. The oil industry relies upon Phil Verliger for all of their analysis. None other than Phil Verliger looked at the RFS and said, hmm, it's reducing our demand for gasoline imports. It's expanding gasoline supply. Ethanol today is significantly less expensive than gasoline. This is actually reducing consumer gasoline costs. His conclusion was between 50 cents and $1.50 is how much ethanol in the RFS today is saving consumers. Now, I'll even ignore the high end. 50 cents, the low end, from an oil industry analyst. <coughs> That's a huge benefit for consumers. Does this administration really want to roll something back that is reducing gasoline prices 50 cents a gallon? I don't think so. I think the administration still cares about advanced biofuels, about new technologies. They want to see this industry continue to evolve. And here again, Iowa is leading. You get to pot, building a plant today in Nevada. You got Poet, DSM, with their Project Liberty. Outside of Iowa, you got Abengoa, 
a Spanish company that is invested here in the United States that is commissioning a cellulose and ethanol facility right now. They're producing electricity. They're going to start producing fuel next month. You get Iogen in Florida producing cellulose and ethanol from municipal solid waste today. You got Quad County, another Iowa company that's producing from corn but is building bolt-on technology that will convert the fiber that's coming into the plant, which is cellulose, into cellulose and ethanol. This is happening today. Every one of these companies will tell you if EPA's proposal is finalized, their investments go out the window. And this proposal risks the future. Does the administration really want to do that? I sure hope not. I don't think they want to. If they know what they're doing, they won't. So the comment period closes today. I'm guessing that everybody in this room has already filed comments. I did. <laughs> I would encourage you, if you haven't, to do so. Because the comments will matter. API is probably going to have hundreds of thousands of comments generated from their hitting the one on the telephone. Our comments, I hope, are going to be deeper than that. And EPA is going to have to take some time to review all of those comments, and they will. But ultimately, this is a political decision. Ultimately, the White House has to continue to hear from you. Even if you filed comments, make sure that you're continuing to let your members of Congress know that you're continuing to put pressure, political pressure, on this administration to do the right thing. If finalized, this proposal turns the RFS completely on its head. What was the renewable fuel standard intended to do? It was intended to drive innovation in ethanol production technologies. It's doing that. The investments in this state demonstrate it is being successful. We've got sales of ethanol today in the, on the cusp of commercialization. The other thing that it was intended to do was to drive innovation in ethanol marketing. Now, the Congress knew when they passed a 36 billion gallon renewable fuel standard in 2005, sorry, 2007, that you weren't going to get 36 billion gallons in 10% ethanol blends unless you had a 360 billion gallon gasoline market, which nobody anticipated having. The oil industry is trying to recreate history and saying, well, because gasoline consumption is falling, it no longer can keep up with the rising RFS, and we have to blend more than 10%, and we can't do that. And, and some folks at the White House have said, oh, yeah. If you tell me you can't do it, then we probably shouldn't be asking you to do it. Bunk! That's what the RFS was intended to do. It wasn't intended to be convenient for ExxonMobil. It was intended to make ExxonMobil invest in higher blends, to invest in E85 infrastructure, to allow E15 or E20 or E30 to be sold, to give consumers some choice at the pump. If this was ever going to be just a 10% mandate, the Congress knew how to write that. They didn't write that. They wrote a program that was going to drive more renewable fuels into the marketplace. And that's what EPA should finalize. To do anything less. <laughs> to do anything less is to ignore the statute, is to ignore the tremendous economic benefits of growing renewable fuels, is to ignore the potential of cellulose and ethanol and other bio advanced biofuels is to turn their back on the environmental benefits of reducing carbon. So we have to keep their feet to the fire. And I know that, that you will help us do that. Now, EPA is going to be evaluating hundreds of thousands of comments. It's going to take them a few months to do so. 
And I know that the agency ultimately will increase the number. I know they're going to do that. They have to. They have underestimated gasoline consumption next year. They have underestimated how much E85 is sold. They've underestimated how much E15 potential there is. So they're going to have to adjust their numbers. But they need to do more than that. They need to return the integrity of the program. They need to recognize that the RIN credits aren't something to be afraid of. The RIN credits that had jumped in, in value last year is exactly the mechanism that will drive the kind of change we need. Last summer, you began to see it. As the credit prices for RINs started to increase, you saw companies saying, hey, I'm going to invest in E85. I'm going to price E85 so that it will enter the marketplace more aggressively. I'm going to allow E15 to be used. Exactly what the, the credits were supposed to do. What EPA is doing is turning that on its head. They're trying to drive down the credit price. Well, the credits were always anticipated to be the alternative compliance mechanism. What some refiners would do when they couldn't or, or wouldn't utilize the primary compliance mechanism, which was buying more ethanol and investing in higher blend technologies. It makes no sense for them to be flipping this on its head. But it'll take them a while. They need to re return the credit system and allow it to be the market-changing force that it was intended to be. I, I've worked in D.C. for 35 years. In all of my time in Washington, D.C., I've never seen the Congress get it as right as they did with this program. Think about it. Here you had a, the most forward-looking energy policy the world had ever seen. It has revitalized rural communities. It has increased jobs. It has lowered the price of gasoline. It has reduced carbon emissions. It did everything it was supposed to do. And rather than proclaim a success, Washington, D.C. says, no, wait a minute. We're told by Exxon that this is a bad program. We've got to revisit it. You can't let them do it. So after EPA finally promulgates whatever it is that they're going to promulgate, we're going to have some choices to make. Hopefully those choices are thanking EPA and moving on. If they continue as they have, you know, look, this is certainly ripe for litigation, and we will not shy away from defending this program to the bitter end. It is too successful and it's too important for our nation's energy, economic, and environmental future, and we will do that. But hopefully, because of you, we'll be celebrating some success. Beyond the RFS, our future is bright, no matter what happens. Ethanol is now a ubiquitous component of the motor fuels market, and you made that happen. We are the, the best octane source. You just heard a great discussion about how vehicles in the future, in order to meet CAFE, are going to require the higher ethanol blends because we can provide the cleanest octane. Tremendous. The industry is looking today to build export markets because if ExxonMobil doesn't want to use us here, maybe ExxonMobil will use us in Brazil or China. Steve talked a little bit about the export markets and where they're growing. Last month, we got great news because for the very first time, China actually accepted some U.S. ethanol imports. We're going to continue to build those. Infrastructure is going to continue to be critically important to all of us. No matter what happens with the RFS, we need to make sure that there's infrastructure out there so that more people do have access to E85. E15, E30, whatever blend makes the most sense for their vehicle and their wallet. It's clear that the oil companies aren't going to build that infrastructure. We're going to have to do it as an industry. It's going to be a busy year. It's going to be, Steve said, a challenging year. I look at it 
as a wonderful opportunity to continue to do what you and Iowa have done for a generation, and that is to educate people about this fuel, to seize the opportunities that ethanol provides, and to build a more secure future for our children. So, thank you. Can we take some questions? I think we have time for a few questions. Uh, one or two. Does anybody have a question for Mr. Deneen? Uh, Bob, Larry Johnson from Minnesota. Uh, wait, wait a minute. Just so you all know, in case you don't know Larry, Larry's the ethanol answer man <laughs> asking me a question. Yes, Larry. You never miss a turn, do you? <laughs> <laughs> I'm wondering if this isn't just a numbers game, because in fact, everything that's ever been, could be said, was said before the comment period. So comment, it's only going to repeat things. But specifically now, how do you think EPA is going to evaluate and read and catalog all of this? Will somebody be, really be reading the content of every comment, everything that's been put in? EPA has an obligation to read every single comment. And while there's no question that a lot of the uh, comments that they will receive, they will have heard before. But uh, we're submitting a lot of data on E85 use, on E15's potential, that the agency has not seen. We went out, we did a lot of new research on what the, the actual impact of RINs are on gasoline prices. We've done other research on other elements of this. So the, they will be reviewing a lot of new data as well. But as, as I said, it's oftentimes not the 120 pages of comments that we will file or the studies. Sometimes it's just those personal stories. Uh, and I think a, a comment from Walt Wendland that made it so crystal clear why this issue is important for farmers is more compelling than all of the data that the RFA will ever submit. Yep. Hi, uh, Peter Shurnian. Uh, independent reporter and citizen of Iowa. Um, it seems to me that the, the people that are really behind the destruction of this are the people that don't want to pay taxes in an industry. Uh, instead, they get millions, billions of dollars of incentives to keep their industries going where we in this industry create jobs that pay enormous amount of federal taxes as well as state taxes, and the government to, for the EPA to come along and say, oh, you, you, we're gonna turn this on our head. Well, they're screwing themselves, if you'll pardon the expression, because then the, the destroyed industry, the federal government doesn't make the taxes from all those jobs that are created, all those products that are sold, and again, they keep paying out subsidies to an industry that doesn't need the money. $30 billion in profits, Exxon Oil, for example, made uh, last year and the year before and the year before. And with the projected income over the next 100 years in the trillions, maybe even 100 trillion, 200 trillion dollars in profits, that they expect. Well, Peter, thank you for teeing up that title. Let's, let me see if I can hit it. You would be surprised how many people in Washington, D.C. believe that you all are subsidized and ExxonMobil gets nothing. And I get the deer in the headlights looks from members of Congress and, and the media that when I, when I tell them no, the only liquid transportation fuel getting a subsidy today is oil. They get subsidies to help them drill in the Gulf. They get subsidies for letting them frack in North Dakota to produce this black stuff. And they are continuing to fight to maintain those tax incentives with, with a fervor that is impressive, although it's frustrating. And when I explain to people that our industry receives no tax incentives, this program costs the taxpayer not a dime. And in fact, because 
this program has done what it is designed to do, giving a value-added market for farmers, farm program costs have plummeted. More than 87% less today than when the RFS was passed. Now, so the taxpayers are getting a huge benefit with this program. I don't think ExxonMobil needs to get a taxpayer incentive to drill in the Gulf. I think the marketplace is already providing that encouragement at $100 a barrel. If they're not drilling wherever they can drill, they, they got to have their head examined. I don't think ConocoPhillips needs to have a tax incentive to frack in North Dakota. Again, at $100 a barrel, that's probably something that they should do. That is part of the education process that's still necessary. The Iowa congressional delegation gets it. I would encourage you to keep sending to Washington, D.C. people that understand agriculture and maybe ethanol specifically so that Washington, D.C. is getting the right information if you know anybody like that. <laughs> Thank you.